know, the fact that it's freezing in here makes that even a little bit more creepy, doesn't it? <laughs> like you can see your breath, you know, or at least you think you can. It's like, oh, what's going on in here? Sixth sense. Um, <clears throat> no, uh, as you guys heard just from Pastor Scott, we are in the second week of our series, What's Under Your Bed? And what we've been talking about in this series is our greatest fears. We started this series last week, um, and I told you guys over the next couple of weeks, my goal was to scare you. Of course, I was being a little bit silly, but we are going to be talking about fears in our lives. And we're not going to be talking about the ones that, um, you know, we're not going to talk about your everyday ones like snakes and spiders and clowns, right? <laughs> we're going to talk about real fears, fears that our inner life, fears that control us, fears that are always on the back of our minds, those fears that keep us up at night, those fears that cause us to have anxiety. Um, <clears throat> it's just the fear that causes destruction in our life and then the fear that really, really tries to control us. And so last week, one of the things that we said is this kind of fear, this is fear, um, uh, the kind of fear that kind of consumes us this way. These are things that, that we ourselves um, have hidden. Um, we said this, we said, the things we fear the most are the things we ourselves have hidden. And so last week we kind of talked about, we talked about our shame, right? Like no one wants to talk about their shame. No one wants to expose uh, the things from their past or the things even currently going on in their life that brings them shame. And the reason we said that happens is because we don't like the feeling of guilt and condemnation. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> we're so afraid we have so much fear when it comes to that condemnation that we just, we just try to cover up our sin. We try to hide it. We try to stuff it under our mattress and forget about it. But what we learned is that just will, over time, that just begins to consume us. It overwhelms us because even though we try to hide it, we can never really forget it. Uncovering it just, I mean, covering it just doesn't work. And so what we said last week is that we have to uncover our sin. We have to expose it. Because when we do, this is what happens. It says, we said, when we uncover our sins before God, he covers them from his judgment. See, the enemy likes to creep in. He likes to um, use our, our fear of condemnation, our, our fear of being found out against us. And what he does is he condemns us further until we isolate ourselves from God until we, and, and until we isolate ourselves from other people. And what we said last week is, that, no, you need to bring those things into the light. We need to, to, to bring those things to God. We need to confess our sin. And, and when we do, God is quick to forgive us because it's his kindness, not his condemnation, that, that leads us to repentance, that changes our heart. And so I hope last week, if any of you, you were dealing with some past sin or some shame or you've been carrying around that condemnation, I, I hope you found this, the courage this week to uncover that sin, to c confess it and receive the blessing that we get um, through the forgiveness and through the grace of, of Jesus. This week, we're going to again be talking about one of our greatest fears. Um, and again, we're going to be looking at the life of David. Last week, we looked at the story of David and Bathsheba. This week, I want to look at another event in the life of King David. Um, and we're going to be looking at it. Uh, but to start out, we're going to be looking at the life of the first king of Israel. His name was Saul. Because here's the thing. Saul was a different kind of king than David. And what I want us to do today as we look at both of their lives is I want us to talk about, you know, kind of compare and contrast, kind of look at their lives and, and look at how each one of them dealt with their fear. Because I believe it can help us when, when we get ready to deal with our own fear. And so for us to do that, though, I have to tell you a little bit more about Saul. So um, with that, I'm just going to jump right in because we've got a lot of ground to cover. Literally, this event, these things that I'm going to be talking about, they, they cover like 15 chapters of Scripture. And so I know you guys want to be out of here before 1 o'clock. Uh, and so we're going to jump right into it. But <clears throat> Saul was the first king of Israel. Um, he was the first king that they ever had. Up until the point that Saul was anointed king, um, uh, they had always been, the, the people of Israel, they had always been ruled by someone who seemed to have a direct line of God, whether it be a judge or a prophet. God used these men. He would communicate into the life of a prophet. Really, really what we would say is that God was their king. And he used judges and prophets to send his message. And so um, that's, how, that's how for the longest time things went along. God would, uh, God would choose a prophet. He would tell this prophet what he wanted. This prophet would communicate it to the people, and the people would either listen and be blessed or, of course, disobey and, and, and feel the consequences of it. But at some point, this system just started to break down, and, and the people just didn't like it anymore. They, they wanted something different. They looked around, and they saw what everybody else had, and they said, you know what? We really want a king. 
We want a king like everybody else has. So they go to the prophet Samuel and they say, hey, Samuel, we want you to appoint us a king. We want someone to go before us in battle like everybody else has. Every time we go in the battle, man, there's this king and he's leading those armies and we want that. Now, of course, you know, they're, they're choosing a man over God. And so God warns them. He says, you know what? If you want a king, I'll give you a king. But just, just so you know, you're going to suffer at the hands of this king the same way those people suffer. I mean, I understand why you guys want a king. Have you looked around recently? Have you seen a king um, that's greater than me, right? But that nonetheless, they, they, they're persistent. And so God gives them exactly what they want. And he sends Samuel out to anoint this king, to find this king. And the man that he chooses is a guy named Saul. Now, when we're first introduced to Saul, he appears to be a pretty humble guy. Now, what the scripture tells us is that Saul was very good looking. As a matter of fact, there wasn't a man in all of Israel who, who looked as good as Saul. That, what a great compliment, right? Like, who wouldn't like that compliment? And it said that he stood a foot taller than anybody else. So you would think, man, maybe he's a little arrogant. Maybe he's a little... Um, cocky, right? Like he's got some bravado to him. But when Samuel comes to Saul, and, and, I, and before he even tells him God's plans for him, all he does is he invites him to dinner, and he gives him a couple of compliments. Listen to how Saul reacts to these compliments. He says, Saul answered, but I, am I not a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel? And is not my clan the least of all the clans of the tribe of ben- Benjamin? Why do you say a, such a thing to me? Saul just doesn't understand why Samuel, this great prophet, is even talking to him. He can't believe that he's being invited to have dinner at Samuel's table. I mean, he, he's, he's a humble guy. As a matter of fact, at this point um, in the story, what we know is that Saul is out looking for his dad's lost donkeys. Pretty prestigious job, right? Like he is literally out hunting down his dad's donkeys. I mean, uh, that was his job. That was his daily duties. And now we have him going from this young guy who served his father, who was a servant in his father's home, who was good looking and fit the part on the exterior, literally being anointed king. And the scripture tells us that that Saul is anointed king at 30 years old. Now, can you imagine taking on that kind of responsibility at 30 years old? Because I can tell you, I can't. I can't imagine the pressure that it must have been on him. Uh, guys were joking with me in the back earlier. Whenever I sit down, you can see this big gray patch right here on the middle of my head. And, and I call that patch Ridge Church. That's Ridge Church's patch. Because at 30 years old, I helped plant a church. And it was, it's overwhelmed me. It scared me to death. And so there's a lot of stress that's come in with that because I didn't know what I was doing. And, and it freaked me out. And, I've, and, 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 and it caused me anxiety and it caused me stress. And so I can't imagine being Saul and being 30 years old and being responsible for an entire nation. Not only that, being the very first king, being the very first person to ever have this responsibility. Can you imagine the pressure that he must have felt the, the, you know, to, to make everybody happy, to do a good job, to please both the people and to please God, to not mess up, to not make a mistake, to not embarrass himself. I mean, I can imagine the pressure. And the thing is, is it was real. And over time, Saul began to melt under that pressure. And the first sign that we get that Saul is beginning to melt under that pressure is he, he begins to compromise. He begins to not trust fully in God. He begins to not be fully obedient to what God has told him to do. And he, he, he compromises and he cuts corners. And in the very first incident where he cuts a corner, um, uh, listen to what uh, the rebuke that he gets from Samuel. The very first time he makes a compromise, listen to this. It says, you have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over all of Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. Like literally after one compromise... After one time being disobedient to God, this is the rebuke that he gets. I mean, he's told, like, you, 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 you've messed up everything. You have ruined it all. But I, I don't think God was judging Saul on this one incident. I think Saul saw something going on in the heart. I mean, I think God saw something going on in the heart of King Saul, and he knew that a pattern was starting to take place. He knew that he was losing contr- that God, God knew that he was losing control of Saul that Saul had allowed something in 
that was taking place and taking precedent over him. That, that from this point on, that we, we're, we're going to see a pattern in Saul, and we're immediately going to realize that, that God was right. That, that Saul was being controlled by something, and it wasn't a good thing. And so right away, um, just a couple of chapters over, uh, Saul makes another compromise. He does it again, again. He goes against everything that, um, everything that he knew. Like God, God had been so faithful to him. He had won so many battles, but he gets into this sticky situation. And instead of trusting God, once again, he chooses to compromise. He chooses to cut a corner. And it, it's a slight corner to cut, but he chooses to cut a corner. See, what happened is, is God told Saul to go in and destroy uh, just destroy this whole village, this whole community in battle. He, he wanted it completely wiped out. And so when, when, when his men go in and destroy the community, they're not supposed to bring anything back with them. But Saul says, you know what? You guys deserve it. You, you guys can take some plunder. But when you get back, make a burnt offering to God with some of what you bring back, and he should be happy. Well, of course, we know that, he, again, he disobeyed God. He didn't follow the directions of God. And so Samuel comes once again, and he gives him this huge rebuke. It's like, Saul, how can you be so silly? You know what happened last time you compromised. And see, God's not fooled by you. See, God knows that you're just offering a burnt offering because you're trying to appease both him and these men, and it just doesn't work that way. And so, so once again, Samuel rebukes Saul. And listen to Saul's response. He says, the Lord has sought out a man. <clears throat> I'm sorry, next slide. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I have violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, so I gave in to them. The answer is right there. Why is Saul compromising? Why is he disobeying God? The answer is he was afraid. Saul was afraid. Saul was afraid of his men. Now, why in the world would Saul be afraid of his men? Here he is, the first king of Israel, and he's having great success. He has won many battles. As a matter of fact, they had just won. And yet we find Saul here in this moment again, uh, I mean, here in this moment again compromising. And the reason he compromised is because he said he was afraid. He said that he was afraid. Now, if you're the king, what do you have to be afraid of? What do you have to be afraid of? Do you, did Saul really think that his men were going to hurt him? That he was going to lose his life? I'm not sure. When I thought about it and I chewed on a little longer, you know, what we immediately go to is, you know what, I think Saul was just afraid that he was going to lose face with his men, right? He was afraid that he was going to lose their respect. He was afraid he was going to lose the prestige that he had. He was afraid that he was going to lose their admiration. He, he was afraid he was going to lose control over them. If he didn't give them what they wanted, if he didn't award them for doing a good job, they, they may not believe in him anymore, what, when we pull it all down, what, what Saul was afraid of was loss. He was afraid of loss. He was afraid of losing something, something that he had, this position as king, something that he loved. And see, here's the thing that I want to talk about today, because this is what I believe. When, when we pull it all down, all fear is an emotion caused by belief in looming potential loss. Let me say that again. Fear is an emotion caused by belief in looming potential loss. What that means is when you're afraid, when you feel fear, it's because you believe that there's potential that you might lose something, that, you, that you may, something may go away, right? Like it's that fear of looming potential loss. It's, it's, it's when someone holds a gun to you, holds you at gunpoint, and you feel fear. Why? Because of the potential loss of life, right? <laughs> you, you could die, and so it's the, it's the looming potential that you could lose your life that brings fear into your heart. How about this? Uh, for me, it's a, I can walk up on a snake and experience that exact same thing, right? I can walk up on the snake and it'll scare me to death. For Pastor Tripp, it's a cockroach, right? He literally thinks, you know, when he sees a cockroach, that his life is in danger. I got to tell this story because it just happened a couple of weeks ago. Um, literally, I don't know how many of you caught it, but a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Tripp had a visitor join him on stage. And it was a cockroach about that long with some really long, uh, what we call antennas, you know? And like he was like creeping on the stage and I was sitting on the front row and I was like, oh no. Oh no, because I understand Pastor Tripp's fear of cockroaches. And so I never said anything. And it went back and it left and then it came out again and I kept freaking out. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to handle the situation. Finally, it walks all the way out, parks itself about 
a two feet in front of Pastor Tripp, and I'm going, oh, this could be the end of Ridge Church, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Literally, this is not a good situation. And it runs past and falls off the stage, and it was like, hallelujah. I was praying the whole time, I promise you. I was praying. And, 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 and here's the thing. After the service, I said, Pastor Tripp, I said, did you see the cockroaches? On? He's like, what are you talking about? Like, immediately. I'm like, I mean, he was big. And he's like, well, why didn't you do something about it? It might as well have been a rattlesnake up here with him. I'm telling you, he looked me dead in the eye and said, never let that happen again. He, and he was dead serious. He said, I don't care what you have to do. You climb onto that stage, you roll up there, and you smash it. You get rid of it. But never let that happen again. Because he literally feared for his life. Now, he may have not lost his life. But he certainly could have lost his dignity over here had, had, had that roach ran up his, over his foot or up his leg or anything else. And so there, there's certainly a fear of loss. And, and loss can be anything. Like, it can be the loss of your dignity. dignity. That's what embarrassment is. You know, nobody, everybody's afraid to be embarrassed. That's why public speaking is one of the people's biggest fears is because we don't want to lose our dignity. We, we, we don't want to lose people's <laughs> respect or we want to change how people see us, right? But there's other losses. I know one of the men's greatest fear, one of, uh, and maybe it's just men, but maybe women too, but I know I hear it from men all the time, is um, we're scared of losing our financial security. We're scared of losing our jobs because we feel this burden of providing for our families, right? And so it's always lingering. There's always that fear. What if something happened? What, you know, what if I lost my job? What if there were layoffs? What if this happened? What if, that, what if I had an accident? What if I couldn't provide for my family? And that fear, that fear will cause anxiety. You know, a couple of people get laid off at work and all of a sudden you're next. And it, and it, and it will absolutely consume you. But again, it's that fear of loss. Loss of financial security. Or, or how about this one? A loss of a loved one. How many of you are just a little bit overwhelmed by the thought of losing someone that you care about? It, it pops up, especially when you get a bad diagnosis, right? When, when you walk, in, walk into a doctor's office or a hospital room and you find out that somebody that you care for has cancer. And even though we know many people survive cancer on a daily basis, that fear sets in and it consumes us and it overwhelms us. Um, and, we, and we just fear losing that person. Or, or maybe it's not cancer at all. Maybe it's just your spouse isn't, doesn't seem to love you like they used to love you, right? Like the romance is gone and the attention that you used to get is gone. And so that fear wells up in you that, that maybe they're going to leave you. Maybe they're going to abandon you. Maybe you're going to lose them. Maybe there's going to be some kind of separation. And it's those kind of fears. Are y'all tracking with me? Those kind of fears that, that overwhelm us. You know, what if something happens to my kids? You know, I don't know what I would do without my children. And it's those kinds of losses that, that just bring so much anxiety to our life. And here's the thing. And, and, here, and that's what was true about King Saul. Because Saul had so much to lose. He was king. He had a pretty sweet life. He went from chasing donkeys to, you know, sitting on a throne, to, from being admired, to being prestigious, having all the comforts and security in his life. And what's true is, is the only people with nothing to fear are those who have nothing to lose. Wouldn't you agree? The only people in this world who have nothing to fear are those who have nothing to lose. And we, we talk about those people. We say those people are dangerous, Right? Like people with nothing to lose, you, you better watch out for them because they're not probably safe people to be around. But those are the only people it is. But I don't know about you guys. I have a lot to lose. I have a wife that I love dearly. I have children that are my whole world that I love coming home to. I have a, a, a home that, that, I, that I appreciate and that I, I, I love. I have a job that I'm passionate about. I have so many things in my life. I have great, incredible friends I mean, there's so much. I look around me and go, man, I, Lord, I don't want to give up any of this. I love my life. And so here's the tension I want us to deal with today. How do we avoid being controlled by fear when we have so much to lose? How do we avoid it? When our lives are good, when things are great, when we look around and say, man, I love this and I love this and I want this and this is great. How, how do we avoid being controlled by fear when we have so much to lose? I would say the first thing that we try to do is we try to protect what we have, right? Like, uh, you know, we just want to protect it. We want to keep it safe. When I was a kid, we would go trick-or-treating trick -or -treating every year, right? And um, when we go trick-or-treating, my, my, my mom used to take us to what we called the rich neighborhoods, right? Like, because the rich neighborhoods gave the good candy. Sometimes they give you like a whole candy bar, like not a little one, like the big ones, right? 
And so we would drive around to the rich neighborhoods, all these, these neighborhoods with the big houses, you know, we would go trick-or-treating. And it was a blast. We loved doing it. And then we would come home, and what we would do is me and my brothers, and we always went with my cousins too, so there was like seven or eight of us. We would get into the living room floor, and we would dump all of our candy out in a big pile right on the floor right in front of us. And then our moms would provide us with sandwich baggies. And then we would separate all of our candy, right? Like, anybody ever do that? Like, oh, chocolate's got to go in this bag. Um, you know, uh, like hard candy has to go in this bag. Tootsie Rolls have to go in this bag. Oh, I got like six Kit Kats. They get their own bag, right? And like literally we would do that. And then once we got everything separated, we would trade and barter with one, one another. Like, oh, you like Kit Kats. Well, I'll trade you two Skittles for four Kit Kats, you know, like, um, <clears throat> like, and we would make these deals and, and it was a great night. But you know what I did immediately after all that? I had this little box and it stayed under my bed. And it had a little key on it. <laughs> and guess what I'd do? I'd take all my favorite things and I'd stick them in my little box and I'd slide them under my bed. You know why? Because I wanted to protect what I have. Right? And that is our very first instinct. Whether you're a kid or adult, your first instinct is to slide it under the bed to protect the things that you have, to hold on tight and not let it go, to do everything you can do to remain in control of it right? In my house, if I didn't do that, it would have been gone. I promise you. I had two older brothers and my mom loved chocolate. It would not have lasted. It would have been gone. And so that's what I did. Well, as adults, we do the same thing, right? Just this past week, I, I, I spent a couple hours on the phone dealing with insurance companies. Isn't that fun, right? Trying to get our rates adjusted, trying to get a better deal. And it's like, I'm sitting there on the phone. I'm like, I cannot believe I'm going through all this for vehicles that are, they're 13 years old. Like, um, like, and yet I have to have insurance because I don't want to lose, if we wreck one of them, I don't want to lose our financial security. You know, after I pay, after I pay that, you know, that deductible, I may get 3000 bucks, but it, it matters to me. So we're going to figure this out, you know? And, and then, and then again, I'm, you know, we have life insurance. Katie and I have had life insurance long before we could ever afford life insurance. And you know why? Because a buddy of mine played on my fear of loss right out of college. You know, he got him a good job with the insurance company and he came over and said, hey man, who's going to take care of your wife if you die? You know, and at the point we're living in a 14 by 70 trailer, we have nothing to our name and he convinces me we need a million dollars in life insurance. I, I still don't know how that happened, but he played on my fears. But here's the thing, I don't have any problem with insurance, but the problem is we want insurance for everything and it just doesn't exist, right? Like we can have insurance to help with our medical bills, but that's not going to keep us or our loved ones from getting sick, right? Insurance doesn't keep us from losing our jobs, right? Insurance, insurance doesn't keep people from dying. Insurance doesn't, it doesn't cover divorce, right? In insurance, the insurance just insurance doesn't co cover the the economy going down the drain. It doesn't cover cover the government collapsing. At the end of the day, as much as we want control, as much as we try to predict the things that could go wrong in our life, at the end of the day, we just got to know that we don't have control. We don't have control. We can't control it. But that doesn't keep us from trying, right? And that's where that compromise comes in. And that's exactly what was going on with Saul. Saul, had, he loved his life. He loved how things were going in his life, and, and, he, he, and he wanted to hang on to it. And so when his men started getting antsy, when they wanted to, to flee, when they wanted to run, <clears throat> he, he had a choice. He could trust God, or he could, take things, he could disobey God and take things into his own hands. He said, well, well God, it's just a small compromise. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to burn this offering without Samuel. I'm going to do it a little early. I, I know this isn't when, when you said I was supposed to do it, but the men, they were getting antsy, and I thought they were going to run. And we, Well, then we could have lost, and everybody would have blamed me, and I could have lost my spot. And so I just decided, God, I know, you weren't, I, know I, I wasn't supposed to, but I just decided the best thing for me to do was to disobey you, make this little small compromise, and take things into my own hands. And we do that. We're all familiar with that. And then once that door's open, once we say, God, God can't be trusted. I have to take things into my own hands. Once that door's open, we continue to do it again and again and again. And here's the thing that I want you to know. Compromising our values are a sign we are being controlled by fear. Compromising our values are a sign that we are being controlled by fear. See, uh, I'll give you an, I'm going to give you an example from my own life. Something I'm dealing, I've been dealing with over the last year, I'm currently dealing with, you know, because it's a church, this is a safe place, right, to talk about these things. 
Well, for me, one of, one of my fears is what I mentioned a minute ago. It's, it's, it's loss of financial security. I, I feel a burden. I feel a responsibility to take care of my family, to make sure that my wife and my children have everything that they need. And so when we started this church a few years back, you know, I knew that I was going to work here and, and do grass lawn service on the side. And so for the last four years, that's what I've been doing. And every year I tell myself, okay, this year I'm going to cut back. And every year is very, very difficult. And I never once have cut back as much as I say that I'm going to cut back. And here's the thing. For four years now, I have been compromising time with my family. I've, been, I, I've said that, you know what, I, I, I value spending time with my wife. I value hanging out and spending time with my children. I value having dinner um, on the night because my wife works night shifts. So I value having the dinner on the nights that we can be home together. I value the weekends that we have together. But every year, when it comes time to make those decisions, to make those cuts, to say, because the great thing about the lawn business is if you're dependable, there's always work. And so it's hard to say no. It's hard to say when, when you're being controlled by fear, it's hard to say enough is enough. I'm not going to compromise my family. And so what I do, I say, well, it's just a couple of weekends a month. It's just two nights a week that I'm working late. I'll cut back next summer. And that compromise begins to fill in my life. And here's the thing, and here's what we all know. Loss is often associated with compromise value. While I, while I was bending to the fear of financial security, of losing financial security, I, didn't, I don't even see what I'm doing to my family. I can't even see the losses that are taking place in my marriage. I can't even see the losses that are taking place in the life, lives of my children because I'm so consumed with this, this loss of financial security. All this other can be going on around me, and I don't even realize it. Compromise can have huge consequences in our life. We've all seen families that have been wrecked, that have been destroyed, just because the man wanted to be a good provider, right? Just because he, he thought he was doing what was best for his family, but he was never home, he was never around, he was never there. Or maybe it was the, uh, the mom or the, the, the female who, d- who did that. It doesn't have to be the man. But they just felt this burden, they saw this loss, they saw this other thing as being more important or, or being the thing that was most at risk. And they were blinded to the actual losses that were taking place in their life. You know, we see it with parents who who hover over their kids, right? You love your kids. You want to keep them safe. You want to provide for them. You want them to have the best life possible. How many people have divorced after their kids graduate? Because for 18 years, their whole life was around taking care and providing and being with their kids. So date night went out the window because the babysitter couldn't be trusted or we couldn't do a night away from the kids. And, and our marriage bed had four kids sleeping in the middle of it because we were afraid that they, they, would, they, they, they would wake up in the night and be scared. Or church went out the door because... They had ball games and, and, and things to do, and, and we wanted to support them in that. And we were scared if we didn't, then we would lose them. And so we compromised, and it led to loss, great loss, terrible loss. The same thing can happen in our jobs. Anytime we compromise our values, it's probably going to lead to some kind of loss, probably not the one that we're expecting. And that's exactly what was taking place with Saul. He had taken things into his own hands. He had compromised, and it, it cost him. God told him, I'm, I'm, I, because of what you've done, I'm going to replace you with a guy after my own heart. I'm going to replace you with somebody else, someone different than you. And so what we find out is, is that God goes out, and he anoints another boy, <laughs> a boy that he says is going to be king, and it's King David, the, the king that we've been talking about and that we're going to continue to talk about in the series. But see, David was, on the exterior, he was the complete opposite of Saul. He was very, very different than Saul. He was a a puny, little, wimpy-looking shepherd boy. He was such the opposite of Saul. When Samuel went to to David's home, to his father's home, to say, hey, I'm going to anoint one of your sons as as king, David didn't even get invited. (laughs) Like, his own dad didn't believe in him, didn't believe that he was good enough to be king. And this is the guy that God chooses. Someone completely different than Saul on the outside. A man after God's own heart on the inside. Again, God was with Saul. It was, it was Saul's disobedience that caused him to, to go out and do this. And, and when Samuel tells Saul that this is going to happen, what happens? That fear in him, it, just, it, it gets stronger. It gets more powerful. 
this shepherd boy, this shepherd boy named David, he ends up in the house of Saul because Saul starts experiencing great anxiety. It causes him to have headaches. And the only thing that would relieve his headaches was David playing the harp. And so David spent a lot of time in Saul's home playing the harp. Little did Saul know this was the one who was going to replace him, right? And as he spends time in, in Saul's home, he becomes part of the family. He gets really close with Saul's kids. Saul begins to see David as, his, as a son. Then one day, David gets the opportunity um, to make his name by fighting Goliath, right? And all of a sudden, David is recognized by the people because he defeats Goliath, and he becomes this great warrior. But all the time, the whole time this is going on, he remains humble, and yet Saul gets more and more threatened by David. More and more, as, 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 as David um, gains prestige, as David gains admiration, it says, it says again and again throughout 1 Samuel that, that, David, that Saul feared David. The thing was that Saul had no reason to feel, fear David because David loved Saul. He loved being a part of his family. He loved being a part. Uh, he, he felt it an honor to be in Saul's home, to be a part of this family. To, I mean, there, there was, he was completely loyal to Saul. He had no thoughts of replacing him as king. And, and that's made very clear throughout Scripture. <clears throat> but that's not enough for Saul. He's blinded. He is consumed with the thought that he's going to lose his place that he's going to lose his position as king. He's going to lose all the things that come along with it, the prestige, the admiration. See, Saul had not remain humble. He, had, he, had, he loved his position. And so <clears throat> finally he breaks. He loses his mind and he decides David has to die. And so from uh, 1 Samuel 18 to 1 Samuel 30, we literally see this story unfolding of David pursuing relentlessly to kill, I mean, Saul pursuing relentlessly to kill David. Saul made it his mission. David had to be taken out, and we get to follow this story. And today I want to look at one incident at the end, uh, really right in the middle of this story where David is fleeing for his life. And I want us to compare how David deals with his fear to how Saul deals with his fear. And it says this, it says, so Saul took 3,000 able young men from all of Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. David, <clears throat> next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, that, that one got cut off. <laughs> it says, David and his men were inside the cave. Now, first thing you need to know is... Um, I, uh, Saul was going, when it says Saul was going in to relieve himself, he was going in to do number two, okay? Like, men, men usually don't have a problem doing number one out in the open. As a matter of fact, many men prefer doing number one out in the open. But number two is one that you want to do in private, right? Like, no one, and, and being king, Saul had that luxury. You know, so they're, they're out. He's got 3,000 men, which was like five times the number of men David had. It, it shows his paranoia. And they're out looking for David, and he sees this cave, and he says, you know what, everybody, we're going to take a break here. I'm going to go up here, and, and I'm going to get in a very vulnerable position. I need a little privacy, and I'm going to relieve myself. Now, you can imagine, and, and he picks this cave that David and his men are actually hiding in the back of. Like, the, their men are hidden in the back, and, you know, it's not like you can go on and just flip on a light, right? And so I'm sure they, the Saul just walked a little bit in the cave to get a little bit of privacy, but he could still see out, you know, but no one else could see in. And you know David's men had to be thinking, this is our lucky day, right? The guy that's been hunting us, the guy that's been going after us is in this super vulnerable position. Like, we could take him out right now. We could take him out. Listen to what they say. They said, the men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. They're, they're pumped. They're saying, David, this is our moment. This is our opportunity. Yeah, we're outnumbered, but, but Saul's doing number two. You can take him out right now. Like you have an opportunity. This is it. This is the day you can, you can take control, right? You can take your life back. You can, you can take it all. And listen to how David responds. He says, he says then David crept up unnoticed and cut off the corner of Saul's robe. What? Are you kidding me? Who has that kind of restraint? David at this point has been hunted like a dog by a man that he loved, a man that he cared for. 
He, he has been running literally for his life. Everything has been taken from him, his freedom, right? Saul was after his life. He, he, he had taken anything that, you know, the relationships. David couldn't even enjoy the relationships because he was always on the run. He was all on time. And in this moment, he had the opportunity to take it all back. In this opportunity, he had, he had the opportunity to, to close his fist and say, this is mine. And all he had to do was kill Saul. That was it. And if you were David's men in this moment, how would you feel? What would you think about that? You know, would you, would you go, oh, good, you cut his robe? Of course not. You go, David, what are you doing? Are you crazy? That was our chance. You're, you're going to miss your opportunity. What's your deal, man? What's wrong with you? Hey, this isn't just about you anymore. We're all running too. We're all scared. We're all running for our lives. We're all hiding in this cave. You know, like, uh, are you that much of a coward? Are you so scared of him that you, that, that you won't take this opportunity? What's the deal? Why are you cutting on his robe? I, I don't understand, David. This was our chance. This was our chance to get our life back. And listen to what it says. It says, not only did David not kill Saul, it says, afterward, David was conscious stricken for having cut off the corner of his robe. David was conscious stricken having cut off the corner of his robe. That's unbelievable. Like, not only did he have the restraint not to kill him, he felt guilty for even cutting his robe because that was a compromise. That was a compromise for David, and, and David didn't do compromise. David understood when you, when you allow compromise, you're being controlled by your fear, and that's not who David was. So listen to what, da- what it says David did. It says, he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. He is the anointed of the Lord. And it says, and then it says, with, with, next slide, guys. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went on his way. Now, if you're David, this was a huge risk to take, Right? Like, not only was he risking the fact that Saul was, he knew Saul was going to continue to come after him. Not only was he risking his life and knowing that Saul was going to come after him, but he was, just like Saul had to deal with losing face with his men, David had the same circumstance. And his men could have easily in that moment called him a coward. They could have turned on him. They could have went to the side of Saul. They could have ignored him and taken out Saul. They could have done a lot of things, but, but not, but David had the courage they, they, David had the courage to stand up what he believed. He had the courage not to compromise. See, even though David had been anointed king, even though he had defeated Goliath, even though he had become this great warrior, in all that, David remained humble. He understood all that he had. It, he didn't get it for himself. Everything that he had came from God. He, it had been something that he had received with open hands. And what David teaches us in this moment is that the key to overcoming our fear of loss is to remain open-handed. See, David saw nothing that he had as his own, not even his own life. He saw everything that he had as a gift from God. And so in David's mind, he was still just a little shepherd boy with nothing to lose. He had not taken claim over the over what God He had not taken claim over anything that God had given him, including the throne. And he just believed that, he said, he said, everything I have is a gift from God. And when it's time for me to have him, have it, he'll give it to me. He would not compromise. He would not compromise. And that that fact, that the idea of remaining open-handed, because see, we're all open-handed when we receive something. But then once we get it, what do we do? We like to close down. We like to protect it. And David's saying, no, no, the key to overcoming your fear of loss it's to stay open-handed, to say, God, it's not mine, it's yours. Do, do what you wish with it. Wouldn't it be incredible to live your life that way? Wouldn't it be absolutely incredible? Here, here's the question that I want to ask you this morning that I think will bring all this into perspective. And it's this. What fear has stopped, what has fear stopped you from doing? What has fear stopped you from doing? And I'm not talking about the silly stuff. I'm not talking about the danger stuff, the silly stuff. I'm not talking about running out into traffic, you know, because that kind of fear is good. I'm talking about what has fear stopped you from doing? What is the vision that God has put on your heart? What is the thing that he has called you to, that he's given to you, that, he's, that you know deep down this is something I'm supposed to do, but you've allowed fear to keep you from doing it? 
You've allowed fear to say, no, God, I know this is what you're calling me to, but man, there's just so much to lose in this situation. You know, I you know, I know this is what I'm supposed to do, but man, there's a lot of risk in that. You know, I, Lord, I know I'm supposed to try to share the gospel with my neighbor, but man, they may not receive it well. It may get awkward. You know, I may lose, you know, the kind of cordial relationship that we have with one another. Ask yourself that question. What what is it? that your fear stopped you from doing, from stepping out, from doing something incredible. Just this past week, we were at Joshua's Men. It's a, a small group for leaders. And we were talking about great men throughout history. And, and one thing that stood out about every man that we talked about was that they were fearless. They took great risk. And I believe the only way that we can take great risk is, is if we remain open-handed. If we say, you know what? All that I have, God, is yours. And I'm going to leave my hands open and I'm going to do what it is that you have called me to. I'm going to step out into it. The only way we can do that is if we, pro- if we trust in God's promises. If we believe that he will never leave us or forsake us. If we believe that we matter to him. If we believe that, that uh, no, no matter what happens, whether we fail or whether we su- succeed, his, his love for us doesn't change. As Christians, that's what allows us to open our hands, to take risks, to do incredible things for the kingdom of God. Here's the thing. Open hands are needed to receive the blessings of God as well as fulfill the mission of God. Open hands. We have to have open hands. There's no way we can do the things that God has called us to as believers if our hands are closed. If we're so worried about those things that we've stuffed under our bed that we want to protect. You know, because God's going to call us to do things that we, we think can't happen. God's going to call us to do things that just doesn't, don't make sense to us. Like letting the man who's trying to kill you go. That doesn't make sense. But David knew that's what God wanted. And he trusted God and he believed in God and he honored God. And what happened with David? It took 22 years for him to be anointed king. And much of that time he was hiding and on the run. But he never forgot God's promises. He believed in God. He trusted in God. He, never, he did not compromise. And now he's, he's the greatest king. He's the greatest king in all of Israel's history. We know that. Not only that, this puny little shepherd boy, it's his family line that brings our Savior into the world. How incredible is that? What an honor. And none of that would have happened if David had, had closed his hands. If he would have said no to God. And so this morning, I I want to encourage us. If you're you're a believer, what is God calling you to? And how is fear controlling you right now? Maybe today is the day that you surrender once again to him and you open your hands and you say, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to step out in faith. I'm going to take a risk for you today. And I believe if you trust in his promise and you open your hands, guess what? Every time you do it, it gets a little easier. So maybe today it's a small thing. Maybe it's a little risk. And tomorrow it's a little bigger risk. But each time it gets a little easier to trust in God and open your hands. And we know that. Some of you are sitting here and you're like King Saul. (laughs) You have convinced yourself that you have to stay in control. And you are completely blind to what God has been trying to do in your life. And here's the thing. I don't have to convince anybody here that we're not in control. Christian or non-Christian, you know At the end of the day, you can't control anything. That your life could be completely turned upside down tomorrow. And it could happen just on your way to work. You know, it it could happen when you wake up in the morning. It could happen. It could happen any time. And so I believe you're left with two choices. You can continue to live in fear. You continue to live in anxiety because you know at the end of the day you're not in control. And so you're just believing the lie. And you're blind to the truth. Or today... You can surrender. You can surrender to the one who is in control. And you can trust in him and you can say, God, I'm tired of living in fear. I'm tired of compromising my values. I'm tired of anxiety and panic controlling my life. And I want to be free. And here's the thing. God will give it to you right now, today. You can have freedom from fear and from anxiety and from worry. He can give that to you. So this morning... I want to give you the opportunity to pray with me if you're here this morning and you want that freedom, let's pray together. Father, we love you so much. God, we're so thankful for the gifts that you have given us in our life. 
God, we're so thankful for Jesus. We're so thankful that like David, Jesus continually pursues us. He reminds us again and again that he loves us, that he wants to know us, that his love is unchanging, that he wants what's best for us. God, and for some reason, often, over and over again, we allow our fear to come in and and convince us otherwise. We close our we close our fists and, and, and we, we don't allow you to work in our lives, God. And today, I just pray for those who are believers in this room, God, I pray that our hands would be open. God, that we would receive what it is that you have for us, that we would do bold things, that we would take great risks for the kingdom of God. And now for everybody else who is here, those of you who, who are not sure that you believe in any of this, I want to remind you that that God isn't going to stop. He's going to continue pursuing you. He loves you. His love for you is infinite and unchanging. And you're going to get reminders again and again that you are not in control. But today he wants to give you the opportunity to overcome that fear, to surrender your life, to know that all that you have is his and has been given by him and that to allow him to be the steward of it in your life, to live an open-handed life with, without fear and worry and anxiety. And so today, I want to lead you in a prayer. So if you would, just, just pray, these, pray this prayer after me. Say, Father, I'm a sinner. I'm lost. I've been trying to do this life on my own. I've been, I've been trying to be in control of everything. But today, I surrender. Today, I'm opening my hands and I'm giving my life to you. Today, I've decided that my life is not my own, that I want to live for you. I want you to take away my fear and my worry and my anxiety. I want to have the freedom of knowing Jesus as my Lord and Savior. That's you this morning. Give it to him right now. Say, Lord, I give you my life. Take it. Father, we thank you for the freedom that we have in Jesus. We thank you for the hope and the grace that we have in his name. God, I pray that as we walk out of this place today, that we will be free from anxiety, that we will be free from worry, God, that we would begin opening our hands and begin trusting you more. Father, we love you so much and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.